Like this notion of liberty, for example. What is liberty? And I think that concept of the will is very important. What the? Who says you can't build muscle on a vegan diet? What's it like being a, a hottie in the vegan community? <laughs> Bitcoin will not work as digital gold. Engineering, technology, these arts of humanity, they are magic. Everyone deserves the same uh, uh, chance, the same treatment, the same respect. Boom, shakalaka, ladies and gentlemen, freaks and geeks. Look at this beautiful character we got right here. <laughs> this man, this soulful brother, is called Jamil J. He is one of the most conscious brothers that had the pleasure of meeting. And uh, we've been estranged for some time. I, uh, well, I feel like a lot of people have in the last few years, but finally got in touch with you and uh, found out you're in Melbourne and you wanted to come on the podcast. So thought it'd be a great opportunity to, uh, to talk about what's been happening over the last few years, talk about society, spirituality, yoga, everything in between, and life. Everything that we're caught up in this uh, Euclidean meat space reality. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, freaks and geeks, brothers and sisters around the world, you are listening to the most conscious podcast in the multiverse. <laughs> yeah, you like that? It's not, 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 not just the planet, yo. Time <laughs> multiverse, yo. Ladies and gentlemen, so um, first and foremost, be sure to check us out on iTunes, Spotify, the Patreon. You know the deal. Appreciate everyone that is dropping those reviews. Appreciate the kisses, the hugs, the belly rubs. And uh, yeah, be sure to tell your mom about me. And uh, all the senoritas, drop us some comments, slide into the DMs, you know what it is. All right, all right, enough, enough fooling around. We got, we got a serious, conscious brother over here. He's a funny man, too. He's soulful. All right, Jamil, you are many things, you know, and granted, I, I could give you an illustrious introduction. I know you're a, uh, a yogi teacher. You are a public speaker. Um, you are someone that has a lot of experience dealing with spirituality, uh, I, I, I obviously know you through work, but since I've known you, you've always been the kind of person that has been interested in the elevation of the body, heart, and mind. And uh, you were definitely a conscious brother, but I feel like you were more than that. And I, I feel like perhaps you could tell us a bit more about yourself, what it is that you yeah, do. Yeah, sure. So um, it's interesting because when, when we were connected, through ANZ. Um, Do you want to get up just a bit close to the microphone? I want to make sure we're getting you nice and crispy over here. Just to Is that better? Lean in. Yep. Um, yeah, just, yeah, it's cool. It's cool. Mm, it's 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 it. It. Yeah, cool. All right. Um, yeah, so when we met, I feel like it was towards, so I first had my self-awakening moment, like, I don't know, when I first came became fully self-aware when i was about 24 and then i started in the bank at 26 and during that time it was very much the intellectual aspect of spirituality you know we become self-aware and then we start asking all of the questions that come with that um like who am i like what is this life what am i living for what's the meaning so then we go on this search so i went for this search and i started reading everything from buddhism to Taoism to christianity to islam to religion to any text that would kind of try and explain what we're doing here um and i remember so intellectually i felt like i had grasped all the, because the knowledge also that i was acquiring was really resonating with my understanding of how things worked. Mm -hmm. So I had this collection or this intellectual database where I could talk about anything. I could literally converse and explore anything through the intellectual mind. But there was a seriousness that came with that. There was a, a taking self too seriously and taking life too seriously because then everything became a trying to show others 
don't you see this? Don't you see this? Don't you see this? Yeah. Don't you see like, how conscious I am? Or, or don't you see that, you know, we're being lied to? Or don't you see that this is not the way we're supposed to live? Or don't you see that there's more to life? It's like constantly trying to um, validate and reinforce my own mental constructs and my own mental understanding. Because the mind needs to keep reinforcing itself. It's how it exists or how it kind of keeps identifying itself with itself. It's like, oh, I'm so smart, or I know and you don't know, I'll show you. Um, and then it was it was one day, I think it was, it was a few years after that, my mum said to me, she's like, oh, you're not fun anymore. It's like, you used to be so much fun, you're not fun anymore. And then it kind of hit me, it's like, I'm not having fun. It's like, yeah, I'm always talking and knowing what to say and having all the wisdom, but I'm not having fun. I'm, my quality of life is no better than when I didn't know anything. So I was like, all right, well, what am I doing? And then that's when my transition from the mind to the body happened. I started moving more. So I started stretching. I started dancing. I started really feeling the body. And then as I went into that process, so the moment that happened, then I'm, I I met my partner at the time and my heart opened. And it was like the first time that I had allowed my heart to open. And the first time I was aware that it was closed in the first place. So I had this expression of heart that fully opened. And I was like, mm. wow, my body feels so much. And it's like, it's such an obvious thing, but it's like, wow, my body feels so intensely. Um. Was this before I met you, by the way? Or was this around the time? This was around the time. This was just before I left ANZ. It's so funny you say that because one of the first things I would have said about you, you know, I could say a lot of things, but you were someone that was very much in your heart. Now, granted, you like to have this philosophical conversational jujitsu session as we do, right? <laughs> you and I would get into so many arguments. We, we got to get into that, some of that shit. But no, you struck me as someone that was very kind of like, you know, happy. You're, I remember you saying at a point that regardless of what happens to you, you probably don't remember this, but you're able to be content. You're able to be present in the moment. Something to that effect. Not those exact words. Like mm -hmm. Your whole attitude was that your kung fu was so strong that at the end of the day, you were just caught up being you and whether or not it was bad or a good experience, you could still appreciate it. So, do you, And to me, that strikes me as the opposite of the kind of like intellectual component. Someone that's just caught up being in the, in the moment, them, their selves caught up in the heart. Well, I guess but it's, it's the, the degree to how we compare ourselves and others, right? Because it's, mm -hmm. it's only in my own journey that I can recognize that I'm not fully in my heart. Okay. So you must have been like a big change. Uh, yeah, it was uh, it was huge. Considering that you, I thought you were already pretty kind of like, you know. Well, because also I, yeah, I I've come with this. I've come with this like wanting to serve. I've come with this wanting to share and wanting to love and valuing connection as the highest form of human play or human beingness. So mm -hmm. it's like as those things are my fundamental values. It's like they're always gonna like even as I say I'm in my intellect. It's like. And there's still an embodiedness that comes with that. It's just the recognition of the subtleties of the identifying of self. So like you identify yourself as a wizard or a, a wise man, or it's like, and then you're like, oh, okay, that's who I am. Mm -hmm. And then you start portraying that into other people's minds. It's like, see me for who I believe I am. Sure. Let me prove it to you. So I feel like the mind to fortify itself does that a lot. So that was the recognition when, the heart opened, it was like those identities don't matter as much because they're, they're so fleeting. Like it's like I, I have to hold them to me for them to keep existing. But if I let go and I'm fully in heart, then it's like there, there's nothing that can be held in that space. It's such an infinite energy. It's like all I can really do is let go into it and allow it to fully take it's like the formless coming through me and then becoming form. But I can only do that if I don't perceive form to begin with. So it's like I become the channel for the universe when I don't perceive who this form is. Oh, I see. I see. So it's like you are no longer attached to yourself and you're more focused on 
allowing what should happen happen like if the universe is able to work through you to achieve a greater good so be it as opposed to you need to prove yourself to the world yes exactly so and that's that's something that can only be accessed through heart space because the heart space doesn't have the conceptualization of i need to do this for me or i need to it, it's just it's just more of a i have something to share sure and it comes from such a different place yeah that's powerful they they speak about the awakening of the Anahata in the Vedic text, and it's representing what you're talking about, like moving into the space of of love and compassion. And they see they say in a lot of the esoteric the traditions that it's only through this mentality that you're able to reach a higher state of awareness in terms of um, developing your your other faculties. Like this is within the Vedic idea of like uh, clairvoyance and. Like the idea of moving the, the kundalini energy through the heart, like that's supposed to be the fulcrum point. Once you bring this energy, because this is this is kind of metaphorical, but the idea is that you're reaching a higher level of consciousness as you bring your kundalini energy uh, higher. And once the heart opens, that's when you can actually move into the higher centers, which deal with uh, better vision, better awareness, and uh, Christ consciousness, so to speak. So I, I conceptually, like I, I, I resonate with what you're saying. And I think it's an extremely difficult thing to do, though, because there is a part of you that wants to achieve things for yourself. Do you experience this in terms yeah, of, of course. yeah, wanting like legacy, wanting to make an impact in the Not, world? I wouldn't say so mm. much legacy. It's but it's so I had this experience recently where mm. I was I, I became aware of all of the the links that I have, like to all the people in my existence. Okay, and then. There was a moment where I fully let it go. Like I let go of all of the links to any person that I know or that knows me. And for a split second, I ceased to exist. And it's like in that ceasing to exist, there is, there's just this peace. There's, there's, there's nothing really to identify because there's no point of reference anymore. So it's like the people in our existence are our points of reference. So we keep trying to fortify our existence in their mind so that we keep having these points of reference but as i kind of move more into um into the self being the point of reference then the self becomes the point of reference and then everyone else reflects that reference rather than looking to others to reflect to me i become the reference point for others to ref to to be seen through me that's deep so deep i may have to go through this at least a couple of times <laughs> to fully understand it but I feel you, brother. I feel you. Uh, so, you mentioned that you 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 met someone, you experienced love. That was the most profound thing that changed you. No, like throughout this uh, metamorphosis. Uh, well, it's actually happened a few times in different ways. So my heart's opened a few times in different ways mm -hmm. because so after after that partner, we were very much. Um, spiritual partners we we did um be passionate full time together we lived on an island together we went to south america together we experienced lots of our conscious growth in the container that we had mm -hmm. so that was the fundamental kind of um thing that brought us together we were we were, we met at a point where we were ready to elevate to the next stage of being huh. and then there was a point where we we couldn't actually unfold any further together. It's as if our paths were now, it's like there was a glass ceiling that neither of us could break through. And we recognized that the connection had brought us as far as we could go in its current um, setting. So it was interesting. We ended the relationship and I went, I went to Adelaide. So there was no... There was no uh I kind of a uh, discontent towards the ending of the relationship. Like there was, it was mutual and it was. Yeah. So, so this, and this is what I was about to yeah. say. So when I went to Adelaide, because we had gotten, we had broken up and gotten back together several times. Mm -hmm. So when I'd gone back, when I was in Adelaide, I was about to do a Vipassana. It was, I think we had broken up the day before and there was a Vipassana course in Adelaide the day after. So I flew from Sydney to Adelaide. And it was just before I was about to go in, I felt to call her and I called her and I said, 
is this is this it this time? Like, are we actually done this time? And she said, yeah, I feel like we are. And as she said that, there was this energy that just lifted and flew out of my body. And there was, there was this new sense of lightness came in. Mm-hmm. And then I did the 10 days. And then after the 10 days, it was on Meta Day and Meta Days. So it was day 10. Um, I was speaking with others and then my heart opened again. And I literally felt the tone of my existence change. Like, it's like if we have a natural rhythm of our existence, I felt my rhythm slow down and change and alter. And I recognized that I was now living a different life. I was no longer living the life I was living with with her. I was now in a different life. That's powerful. And then I went to stay with some really powerful healers um, and shadow workers in Adelaide. And I got, I remember it was, it was a few months after that moment and I got there and I remember getting to my friend's doorstep and I said to her, I can't take a step in any other direction. It's like, I felt like now life was, it had, it had a staleness to it because I was so much in the enforcing of the identity and the being able to get what I want and manipulate and have everything my way because I was so smart and so aware that it's like, I felt this staleness of like, there is no step in any direction that inspires me right now. I can't leave until this identity ceases to exist. I remember I was so clear. It's like, I can't exist in the same way anymore because I had had the heart opening experience, but also my fear and my mental fortitude and constructs weren't willing to let go. So I was in this in-between recognition of this has to go in order for me to go to the next place. And I was, I ended up staying with those shadow workers for six months and it happened. It was one day, a random day. I went through this three week meditation fasting process and I was sitting in the garden, which was beautiful. And then this bliss, this wave of pure bliss just flowed through me and I could feel my heart and I could feel life all around me. And it was just so beautiful. And then the, my mental thought came out. A thought came out and I could literally see it in the sky. It was so defined. It said, am I going to grow if I'm not suffering? And then I looked at it and I was like, wow, is that the belief I've been holding? That I somehow have to overcome or suffer or um, beat or do more in order to grow. Mm-hmm. It's like this idea that I need to prove my worthiness or I have to trudge along in the dark in order to get to the light. I can't just be in the light. Mm. And then as I saw that, I was like, wow, okay, I can let that go. That means nothing to me anymore. Mm. And it was it was at that moment that my consciousness had tilted. It's like there was no longer... Because part of the pushing for consciousness or self-healing is unworthiness. It is one of the fundamental things that pushes us. It's like, I'm unworthy. I want to know more. Or I want to see more. I want to have more. And self-awareness or self-help is the way that's going to make me feel better about myself. That's an interesting perspective. Because I, I look at wanting to grow, wanting to get better. Uh, not so much. I wouldn't use the word to to be unworthy, uh, to to, in association with that I just want like a, I'd say that it's a it's a passion for life like you're so full of life that you want to be as much as you possibly can be like you get excited when you come across um, a new challenge that you know uh, you, is going to really test you that you where you learn something or you, you get taken to a higher level because you realize that uh, there's going to be more that comes from that more experiences more um, more ecstasy so in my experience, there mm. tends to be a harshness with self that comes with that. Mm. Almost like a, I have to push myself to grow. It's like, it's almost like, it's, it's kind of like there's a plant and we're drowning it with so much water because we're like, no, it needs to grow. It can't mm. not grow. So I'm just going to suffocate it with water. Okay. And that's what we kind of do with ourselves. We push ourselves so harsh, I felt. Sure. We're like we push ourselves to grow but growth is a natural phenomenon that happens in life there's mm. a you can move in gentleness and nourishment and soften yes. and you are going to grow 
there's 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 no need to push. There there is no there's there is a natural momentum in life that happens regardless mm. of what you're doing. But the the worth says no, you have to push. No, you have to make it happen. No, you and it's harsh with self. It's like it's not accepting of self. It's from a place of non acceptance. I'm going to challenge this philosophy a little because whereas I, I I resonate with what you're saying, I see the the kernel of truth within this that I think when you are in a state of flow, and you're not trying so hard. That's when you naturally tend to progress. But in terms of achieving goals, let's say you want to be speaking to your your brother just in the background. You can't see him over here. But he, he plays basketball, and uh, obviously he's passionate about that. But if you didn't apply yourself, like if he if he didn't focus on this, make a conscious effort to get better, so train, decided not to go to any training sessions, work out, and make a conscious effort to get better, then chances are, I would say quite definitively, that he wouldn't see as much improvement as someone that, uh, like he wouldn't see as much improvement as opposed to you know, someone that uh, decides that they're, they're not going to do anything. Um, like you see, you, you understand the point I'm trying to make. Like obviously, yeah, if you make a conscious effort to work hard, you'll see improvement. But if you decide just to to wing it, not do anything, not go to training sessions, to to just f- go with the flow, obviously you're not going to see as much r- reward. So, yeah, and I totally agree yeah. with that. However, from from where I've seen it, it's it's mm. it's our it's our framing of it that is kind of distorted because mm. it's like. It's, it's not really about the doing. It's about the clarity with self because it's about the relationship with the doing. So, for example, so, so I train and I don't train in order to be like there's, there's a part of a natural drive in me mm-hmm. and my relationship to doing is very different to, oh, I need to be better or I need to be the best or I need to beat others. It's like it's not about that at all. Mm-hmm. It's actually just a playful relationship with something outside of myself that allows me to grow in a nourishing way. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's because we've, as humans, we've given so much importance on the doing, but the doing is the least important part. It's your relationship to the doing. It's mm. your, it's your relationship to the expression, the reason that you train. It's like we have this thing of procrastination or, laziness it's like well if you really just tuned into what really resonated with you you would do those things anyway yeah i think i understand what you're saying and it's interesting because this was a conversation i actually remember this being your philosophy uh, a few years back you know when yeah. <laughs> we used to work at a and z and we'd have these conversations and I remember you said something to me one time that uh admittedly it triggered me because it had to do with working out and making a conscious effort to, to grow this particular issue and i'm someone uh, from a young age, I've been very uh, focused on working out, whether it's working out, like I work out every single day. I remember you making a point, something to the effect about how people that work out are insecure. I'm not sure if you remember this, but it was following this logic that ultimately, I feel like it kind of comes off of what you're saying now, that ultimately, if you feel as if you need to work out, it's you feel as if there's some kind of inadequacy. Now, I'm not saying you said this per se, but this is the impression that I got. <laughs> yeah, that... Uh, Essentially, people that work out are insecure about something about them. They feel as if they're overweight or they're just not good enough. Therefore, they feel the need to go and work out. And for someone like me, I mean, I work out because don't get me wrong, I like looking good. I'm like, you know, I want to be better. But it, it's what comes from doing that, like the idea of one, achieving something and knowing that you are going to improve upon yourself that makes me want to work out. I feel like there are some people that can work out because they feel a sense of inadequacy, like, look at me, I'm not very good, you know. But I think a lot of people that have this mentality where they want to get better, uh, they want to get a healthier mind as well, because I think the, the body is an extension of the mind. They want to improve themselves, not necessarily because they're selfish, but because they want to make an impact in the world. They focus on things like working out. I think I think this extends to pretty much everything that you do. I think you'll find that people that have this mentality where they, they take care of themselves physically, it permeates into other aspects of their life. These are the kind of people that, uh, I, I, I'd say that if you don't care about the way that you look, the way that you present yourself, what does that say in terms of your ability to commit to achieving something that's difficult? Like uh, it, The same reason the people that go to, let's say, university, which, by the way, I don't think is a good idea at all, right? But I've heard people say it shows that you're able to go to something for a long period of time, turn up, 
every day, so to speak, right? And actually finish. It shows that you have constitution. Yeah. And this is one of the reasons why employers, they find you to be appealing when they, they find that you've done a university degree. It shows that you have uh, stick you know, And it shows that you are someone of substance as opposed to someone that hasn't been able to commit. And I think it's these characteristics that are are what are represented in people that want to grow, that want to work out. So that's kind of like a contrasting philosophy. Mm. What do you think about that? I don't feel like it's too contrasting in terms of... Because, all right, so there's this thing about discipline that I feel like that's, sure. that's the point you're kind of making Absolutely. in a way. It's like discipline is really important. Absolutely. And I completely agree with discipline being important. However, if... So, so I train now and I, I train now because it feels good to move my body and it feels good to, and also there's this reward. There's, there is this reward and satisfaction that comes from training the body. Absolutely. And I feel like also the collective now is moving into the physicality again, because it's kind of like we've done the emotional and spiritual for a while. And it feels like now we need to strengthen the body sure. so that it can hold these new beings or these new containers so that's what feels like it's happening naturally anyway okay um but how is that different to someone that says i want to work out because i want to i want to improve myself so i can uh i can have a healthier mind because i i know that people well, because yeah. because it's, it's kind of a trap in a way because mm. it's like it's like yes, we need to. We there's there's part of our mind that needs to set a goal in order to progress towards something, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it's the conscious side of things. I'd say like the when I say conscious, I mean the, the left brain is more focused on if I do this, I will get that. It's looking at outcomes. It's more focused on the future, right? As opposed yeah. to the holistic mindset of the right brain that's just in the moment. It's just caught up in being. Yeah, that's kind of how I look at it. But I think we need both the conscious and the uh, the intuitive because without the the conscious aspect of things you're kind of just in this state of like where there's no direction but i say so yeah. th it's because i think that is a misconstrued perception okay. so in my experience as i it's so funny so i like i live in the northern rivers at the moment and mm. it's like there's this thing of of it's a very feminine energy there so it can be quite floaty sure. right but what i've noticed is that Left brain and right brain, it's like we, we keep saying the left brain needs this and the right brain needs this. Mm -hmm. and, but what I'm noticing is like, so the, the thing about becoming more self-aware is that you start to become more aware of the subtleties of energy, right? How okay. energy is moving, how things are unfolding. You, you, you're present with them so you can kind of perceive a momentum that's kind of happening in your own life. And what I've recognized is that the more that I let go... Because the only thing that I'm letting go is of the mental constructs of what should happen. Now we're on to something because this I can, I can get on board with. Okay, it, yeah. so, so yeah. the only thing that I'm... The, when we say surrender, it's mm. like even our idea of surrender is almost so passive. It's like surrender, just let mm. go. Just It's like this passive thing of like, oh, just be passive and it'll work out. It's like, mm. no, that's not what, what I perceive as like... It's more like... Um, and I had this realization re recently. Mm -hmm. It's about commitment, right? So I, I was be became aware as a traveler of my kind of fear of committing to anything, like to really committing to things because of the floaty nature that, that I was just talking mm -hmm. about. And then as I shift that, that energy and I commit, I realize that commitment is surrendering, although it's just the active energy rather than the passive energy. So passive energy of surrender, surrendering is very passive. It's like letting go and just saying, oh, yeah, whatever is, is, and whatever happens, happens. Okay. But it kind of like takes no accountability or responsibility for self. Mm -hmm. But the commitment is like, this is where I am in my life currently. I am the creator. I am going to commit to being where I am. Okay. And then as you commit to being where you are, you've actively part now in fully involved in your own life and you're fully participating in your own life, and then you let go. Mm. Then you let go, and then you are living in presence, and then the unfolding is happening, and you're not trying to hold it in any specific way. You are moving with it actively and passively. Okay. So it's, it's a different thing. It's like whenever we talk about, no, we've got to have discipline, it's like discipline doesn't mean 
tell yourself to do something that you really don't feel like doing. Because that is not discipline. That is that is other that's something else. It's because it's like, no, I'm gonna go against my own true knowing because my mind knows better. Well, I guess it's important to be clear with what we are saying when we say this, because you, you said that discipline doesn't mean doing something that you don't feel like doing. And basically it, it does in the, in the mindset, I, I'd say, right? In the like, mind, it, yes. You know, in, in the mindset that uh, you're doing it, whereas you don't feel like doing it right now, um, there is another aspect of you that wants something that comes from that so much that you feel like it's worth doing this thing that you don't enjoy doing in the moment because of the reward that you receive in the future. In the same reason we, we brush our teeth, in the same reason we, we, we take interest in our personal hygiene and so forth. Yeah, totally. And I'll make this point, because there's something that you said in that that I very much resonate with, right? And it's this idea of surrendering, but from the perspective, let me give this context, to the out, outcome. Because I think, whereas I think discipline is important in terms of applying yourself, because I think there's an important aspect of making a conscious effort to do things that you believe are right. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think when you attach to the outcome, like I need to, unless of course I'm able to be the best basketball player in the world, right, from working every single day, I'm not going to be happy. It's that attach, attachment to the outcome that can t stifle your ability to, to grow. I think as soon as you detach from that and you say, I'm just going to do the work, and whatever comes from that, so be it. I mean, I'm doing this with the idea that I want to get somewhere, but you know what? I'm going to detach from the outcome. That right there, that's the attitude of what I call uh, the, the artist. Uh, and this is from one of my favorite books. I always <laughs> reference this, uh, the, uh, the War of Art. Not to be confused with The Art of War. Are you, are you familiar with that book? Yeah, yeah The War of Art. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's called Acting Territorially. This is how Stephen Pressfield puts it. But I'll just say it's being... It's outcome independence thinking. I always use my favorite anime character to represent this. There's this uh, character, Goku, right? He goes through all these different levels of, uh, of powers, right? In his metamorphosis towards becoming the best person. Because he's the personification of discipline. He pushes himself because, one, he loves um, meeting difficult challenges. Yeah. And he doesn't have this attitude of like, oh, woe is me. I'm, I suck. I'm insecure. No, he, he has this attitude where he loves battling so much that he loves being in a state where he can do the best that he can. Yeah. So when he when he finds someone that is better than him and he gets super excited, he's like, oh my God, this guy's guy like even more powerful than I could ever have hoped to be. And I think that's powerful. But more important, yeah, but th this is this is the kernel, right? Yeah. So Goku reaches this state called... Uh, Ultra Instinct. Yes, absolutely. This is, you know, this shit I'm talking about. And... It's actually uh, it's it's when he read when he reached that I was like yes these guys get it because that was that was exactly the same mindset I had bro <laughs> that bro it's uh, bro finally we're <laughs> we're on the same wavelength here because this is I feel like we're a lot of the times we're using words certain concepts to express what we both know intuitively but sometimes it's kind of hard to convey well in my mind to kind of understand the crux of what you're saying because I have a different interpretation of surrender and so forth but what I feel the ultimate autonomous instinct reveals is that in this state where you were um, you were, like, you've done all the hard work all the logic right all the all the thinking right so much because Bruce Lee spoke about this as well to become unnaturally natural and this is where you go through the effort of actually disciplining yourself doing all the hard work right to, to reach this state where you no longer have to think about things you're no longer concerned about needing to achieve anything and you're in the state the zone yes, this uh which is interesting yeah the zen really, state i was just talking to teal about that on the way here okay because he had a basketball game last night and on the way here I, I was i was expressing to him recognizing the the anxiety or the tension or the the franticness of his moving in sport it's like it's very frantic it's there's a lot of pressure absolutely and then what i expressed to him was about flow state and it's like flow state in yeah. itself is the full release of pressure because it's like there is no longer anything to do. So you can let go fully in the doing. So it's like your relationship with it. Because so I've recognized that when I'm playing sport mm -hmm. and I fully come back to my breath and I relax and I let go of any perceived anything needing to happen. Mm-hmm. 
I enter this state where I'm free and I'm fully free in the doing. However, I am not defined by the doing at all. And I move almost as if it's not me. It's almost as if I'm watching myself move. That's it. And I'm, sure, it I'm sure people who listen to this are going to resonate with that because granted, we're, all com we're both coming from this from different perspectives, right? Yeah. Uh, I think ultimately the goal is to be in this state and people can resonate with this where, where it's like going on a, tr on a long road trip where you're driving and you've totally forgotten the fact that you're driving, but your body still um, <laughs> is working aut autonomously, right? And you just, you're, you, it's like there is an inherent intelligence that knows what to do without you even making a conscious effort. And I feel like that's what we're both alluding to. Yeah. Because I feel like I'm coming at this from the well, way to say you need to focus on the conscious aspect, right? And you're coming from this from the, well, you know, you just need to detach from that aspect. But they're both, it's like the alchemical wedding. They're both necessary um, to reach this state of ultimate autonomous instinct. Yeah, because when I expressed yeah. it to Teal, I even said to him, it's like training is perfect for the fundamentals of the body. It's so that the body just can automatically do the things that it needs to do once you let go. And that's, that's the difference between, and that's what I was saying about the commitment and the surrendering. Commitment is the active participant that's like, no, this is what I need to happen. So I'm going to commit to this. And then the surrendering is the passive, okay, now I let go of it fully and let mm. the unfolding or the momentum go where it needs to go. Yes, yes. It's yeah. like responsibility for self. It's like the ability to respond. It's like, that's what it is. How do you feel about people responding to i mean what's your attitude about dealing with trauma i mean when people are going through something that's very difficult um I, let me rephrase that how do you respond to deeply traumatic situations that can be very very detrimental to you like what's your outlook on that because one of the things i remember about you is that you were the no matter what happens i'm going to be okay with it and it's good it's necessary how does your outlook on life uh so it's like this um it's kind it's kind deal of with trauma yeah so mm. it's it's because we're always dealing with our own traumas it's mm. like it's part of the unfolding of self it's like it or infolding i like to see it as like every moment unfolding into self and then every moment i'm seeing more and more of self so mm. it's like and in, in there is the traumas or the the woundings that I've held or even the woundings that I've come in with and then projected on the world to experience. It's like, mm -hmm. so it's like, that's going to keep happening. But there's this, this inner trust. There's like, cause that's what it is. It's, it's really just trust. It's like, no matter what I experience or no matter what I'm going to experience, it's, it's the, the, the frame. So the frame that I see is it's just me experiencing what I came here to do, but almost like a, in a way of like, there's nothing else to do, so I might as well. It's like, let's go on an adventure. It's like, you can't have an adventure if you know what's going to happen. It's no longer an adventure. Mm -hmm. It's like, we, and we, we, we've talked about this before in terms of, um, even when you think of Alan Watts and the dream of life, it's that thing, right? If you could know your dreams and yes. control your dreams, Eventually, you would create more drama, more tension, more this, more that to make it more exciting mm -hmm. until eventually you would create that you forgot that you were dreaming in the first place. Sure. So it very much is that thing of, I already know that it's just me with me. Ultimately, it's just me with me. Mm -hmm. And then all of these other me's exist. There's people me there's tree me's there's animal there's all these other versions of me exist we all come from the same energy and so there's nothing that can happen with me with me it's like i can only ever be challenged or faced with self mm. that's a, a powerful attitude that i've heard expressed not just by you even when i knew you because i <laughs> where is Obviously, we've all gone through different experiences. Like, I feel like the key theme within your outlook on life is this surrendering, being at this state where you are zen. This is the impression that I get anytime I talk to you, right? And I feel like... Oh, it feels more so like mm. the, the framing is to, to recognize self mm -hmm. and relating with self. And then re basically 
because we're already whole. So for me, it's just perceiving the parts of myself that are perceived as separate and bringing them back to me. Yeah. So it feels like that. I I very much respect where you're coming from. I think one of the things I definitely have um, trouble with is my worldview is such that I I also I whereas I acknowledge that we are connected. You know, we're, our, we're all part of this uh, universe, the one verse. Uh, Uni one and versare. I believe that means change. The one change, we're all changing simultaneously. That being said, there are definitely challenges, obstacles. There are definitely things in this world that I see as being issues. And I look at it like this. There are two ways of looking at uh, uh, applying your philosophy uh, towards spirituality, right? Like there's one approach where you kind of have this holistic mentality where you do see everything as being interconnected, right? And you tend to go with the ebbs and flows of the universe. That's the approach of what I call the artist. And then there's the other approach of the warrior, right? That tries to, um, to change things in order to bring about a positive impact, right? Like that, that finds this difficulty within the world or this, uh, for lack of a better word, evil thing that needs to be changed, right? And goes on this quest in order to address this, whether that be, you know, you're some kind of climate change activist or a hardcore vegan or someone that is just anti uh, governments or individuals trying to force their will upon you to uh, uh, to do X and Y, right? Mm. Well, it's and, interesting because I feel like yeah, there's a very like there's a misconception about spirituality that mm-hmm. it is passive. Because yeah, there is. Well, yeah, yeah. That, but I, I, that's what I'm doing: contrasting the passive versus the active. Well, you're saying that they're both the, the same. Is they're that both the same because so mm. so for me in my own experience, as I become more aware and more accepting. I also become more active, uh, but it's not it's not active as in activism. Mm-hmm. It becomes more of being um, an instrument for the universal truth. So it's sure. like it doesn't mean that I I do less. Mm-hmm. If anything, I do more. It just it's it's again it's it's not about the doing. It's about our relationship to the doing. If because if you are an activist, right? Because you've got um, wounding with the father energy right mm-hmm. and the authority just triggers you and mm-hmm. you are against establishment right because what is society i am society you are society mm-hmm. it's like we are society it's like if this is an ocean then every every drop is part of the same ocean it's the same thing in in terms of like the evils of the world are the evils of the self it's like as soon because if we if we can kind of see the individual world and then see the projected world, which is just a representation of the individual world, because so the thing is is that it's so much more convenient for us to have evil because then we can be good or then we can be we can have something to blame, we can have something to say oh, this is doing this, or this is doing this. It's like, but if I change the frame to, I'm doing this, and I can recognize in me where I meet that thing, because every single person's world's different. It's like, yeah, we have this universal world, but every, on a physical sense, but really how I relate to the world is very different to how you relate to the world. Sure. So it can't be the same world, because I don't perceive it the same way as you. Yes, there's these external things that are happening, and this is the thing, we give the doing so much importance that we miss the the undertone of the movement because we don't know how consciousness is moving. Like we have this, like I saw it the other day actually before this podcast and I saw me talking about it. It's like, let's say the world is this blank canvas and every single person is allowed to paint on that canvas. That's the world. The world is this universal canvas that every individual has painted on. And we look at it and we're like, there's so much confusion, there's so much this and that, and I don't understand it at all, right? But we're only seeing it from our own painting on the canvas. So it's like, from my fishbowl, I'm looking out and perceiving what's happening and what it means. We love to give things meaning, or oh, this means this, this means this, this means this. It's like, I don't know what it means. Sure. Here's the, here's the problem I have with that, in in the sense that there are, like, I feel as if you're you're saying that and I think it's true that your perspective on things uh, will determine what 
whether or not it's good or bad, what it is, and so forth, right? Like, when perhaps when you're looking at something from a higher perspective, it has a completely different meaning. But I think there's also objective truth in the, in the, in the idea that there are actual uh, things that happen in this. Like, let's say, how, what's your attitude towards, let's say, having a cancer in your body? Like, what would your perspective... Cancer is resentment. So oh, well, energetically, cancer is resentment. All right, but I'm talking about in the, I guess, clinical sense of the of the word let's say a cancer like a, an actual but th let me let me just let me just uh uh characterize the scenario here because i wanted you to answer this you have a cancer within your body right yes. that is stifling something that you want within your body like for instance st stifling your ability to to think whether it's a brain cancer or move or to do x and y right st stifling your life okay yep. now would your perspective oh well actually let me ask you this how would you deal with that cancer I would be with it fully. So, so it's how, like, well, so because cancer, right? Mm -hmm. So, and this is what I was saying about the subtleties of energy. Okay. So when you become more sensitive, as you become more aware, like your senses, you were talking about the Vedics and they're talking about the senses. Yes. You become aware of energy and the subtleties of how it moves. Sure. So realistically, unless I was ignoring the own energy in my body, cancer wouldn't, because cancer is a repression that grows over time. It keeps growing and growing until it is a fully formed physical manifestation. Sure. But it's subtle energy first. It's subtle energy that I ignored and I pushed and I ignored and I pushed and I ignored and I pushed. Sure. And then eventually... And it's created dis-ease within your body. Dis-ease within my body. Okay. So then now I would be like, okay, what is this thing that I can no longer ignore? Mm -hmm. And it is always like, from my experience, there is no dis-ease that is not my own doing because I am the creator. Yeah, that's... I am the creator of my own existence. I, I understand what you're saying there. I, I guess looking... I'm trying to look at this in a more... in a in a more objective sense and where I know this is... Goes. Yeah, because you, you look at things in a very... like there is no objectivity but let's say... Okay, so let's say the cancer... I'm going to represent the cancer as someone within your life, right? You that cancer? is going... No, um... Uh, yeah, I think we all do on a, on a level. But let me just finish my analogy. Right, you have something within your your world that is going about killing, raping innocent yep. kids, or something all like that. Correct me if I'm wrong. Children, Correct me if I'm wrong. Kids, yeah, these but, things, and it's like, oh, absolutely. As as talk about the oh, like that is the thing that everyone will go to. It's like, oh, what about this? This can't yeah, be sure. Right. And this can't be right. You, you're saying that right. you created that, even though you may actively be trying to fight that thing, right? By trying to get like trying to prevent something that you see as having a negative impact on the world, right? Um, your your menta mentality, just based off of the analogy that you gave, is that, well, you brought this into existence because of you ignoring something. So from like a more of a holistic view, applying this, right? Anytime you see a problem within the world that is actively doing something that you're very much consciously against, correct me if I'm wrong, your worldview is that you brought that into being and the best way to deal with that is to just let it be and go with it. No. It's no, I thought that's be. what you were saying. Oh, then, what, then, what's, then what's your approach? It's to recognize where you meet that thing. Okay, where and how... Do you meet that? Well, my question because to you, how do you address it, though? How do you actually like prevent that? I mean, do, can millions, we agree? There are millions of problems. But can we agree that that thing that we see, let's say that cancer, that being that is doing things that you don't like, or let's say, I know you might say that you don't, you don't see it as a bad, good or bad thing, but can we agree that it's something that you would rather not have and you would rather take it away? Only from my mental construct. Only for well, my, what I believe should be happening. And yeah, this is but, where, but... This is where we're in the trap again. True, but like there... objectivity only creates traps. Uh, yeah, creates... I could not disagree more with that. Because I, th I, I believe that we live in an objective reality. Like, there are certain things that happen regardless of your thoughts, your ideas, and what... Like, granted, we all have perspectives on what things are, right? There is objective truth, but the way in which we perceive it is subjective. Yeah. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel as if what you're saying is that... Um, granted, we can agree that we perceive things subjectively. You're also saying that nothing is objective. Everything within this reality is just a, a construct and there is no substance to anything, which I, I actually don't agree with. I don't feel like, I didn't say that there's no substance to it though. Well, that's, I've, I... Because actually, uh, the, the thing You about, were saying there's no objectivity. I'm saying there, so, uh, yeah. So, there, I, there, it's not that there's no objectivity. It's recognizing our relationship to the objectivity. Because, so it's like, you don't fight against women's rights, right? So it's like, 
you you're you're not an activist for women's rights. I actually am. You know, okay. I, I'm an activist. Are you for an all, activist all for yeah. people with dementia? Um, I would be an activist. You would for, be. Yeah. Okay. I, I would be but in favor is, of dispelling is, anything is which I think there are, stifles someone's uh, exactly. freedom. Exactly. There yeah. are millions of stiflings. Millions. Sure. Okay. Millions. Why do you only pick some? I don't pick some. I, I feel I. Are you activist against all of them at the moment? When Are you, you say actively against all when, of them, when you say active, making a conscious effort to combat something, no, because I, I only have a certain amount of energy. That's However, right. Exactly. However, I'm not. I'm not against and what. What yeah, resonates? I, I'm not against. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So you are. You are a specific energy. Sure. And then, whatever resonates with you resonates with you because of. So, it's like the thing that actually moves us in life is our own wounding and trauma patterns because it is the motivation or the thing that moves us from our own discomfort. We actually move through discomfort. That, that's the thing that keeps us moving. It's like tension builds, we release, we keep moving. So everything that resonates with you in the external world is an internal representation of something. It is. It's like there is nothing that I've experienced in my external reality that I can't connect with in me somewhere. Whether it's my dad not listening to me or not feeling loved by my mom or not feeling heard or not feeling seen or feeling unworthy or feeling like mm. I don't deserve. It's like everything that is experienced in my world, because I said it's every single person's individual world. Mm. Everything that I experience in my world is an energetic representation of the field of energy that I create. Sure. I, so, I would extend that by saying... So, I don't, yeah. so, so for me, mm -hmm. it's like, yes, I recognize that there's starving kids in the world right now. Sure. However, there is no part of that that meets me currently. In terms of like, I, I don't believe that it's... I'm not saying it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. However, I don't resonate with it personally because that's not what I've come with. Yeah, I don't see any disagreement with what you're saying. I, I, I think there's a clear distinction between um, being... Like, being putting your time and energy towards addressing something, right, um, versus uh, being completely against that thing. Like, I'm not, like, the things the, the things that you brought up there, like uh, women's rights and all these, this kind of stuff, these are things that I'm in favor of. Just because I don't devote my time and energy towards them doesn't mean that I'm not in favor of it. I think we need to look at an example where you are actually against that thing, right, because I, I, in a situation where, let's say, I am against something, my argument would be that that thing should is wrong; that it should not, you know, exist. In the sense that I think it's wrong for you know people to to rape kids, right? That's yeah. That's I'm not an activist for something like that. If you wanted to make an argument that the reason I'm not an activist for something like that is because I don't I don't have that within my experiential field, my response to that would be. Well, no, it's because it's got nothing to do with my experience. I'd say intuitively, I think it's wrong. And that's why I'm not in favor of it. I think there's a clear distinction, though, between um, being an activist and actually being against something. Yeah. But um, I agree with what you're saying in the sense that, yeah, we all focus on things that we resonate with, that we, you know, have been part of our experience. But I think the greater point here is that I believe there are certain things in this world that are are things that are worth actually fighting against. And that's kind of like the path of, let's say, what I call the warrior, someone that actually tries to uplift the vibration of the world. Sometimes that involves addressing uh, dark things that go on that are objectively, uh, I, we can get into the whole argument of like good or bad, but are objectively acting in a, in a destructive way towards something that you believe is, is good, love. Yeah, and to that, I would say that any person who um, is on their path of self-awareness is going to be a representation of that love in the objective. Like if I'm walking down the street and I see somebody hurting someone else, mm -hmm. if I'm there, then I am there to meet the situation. Sure. It's not for me to be like, oh, that's wrong or that's right. I'm just going to meet that situation with love, right? Sure. And then that allows the energy of that experience to transmute for me and also the other participants. So it's not passive. It's not, it's not like, mm. like spirituality is a warrior. It's a spiritual warrior. Like you can't be a what I saw it today, actually mm -hmm. this thing of, um, uh, 
someone saying, oh, I don't need to train because I'm an intellectual. And it's like, well, if we leave the the diplomacy to, oh, what was it? Politicians? No. To poli- no, what was it? It's like, we're going to have um, intellects. So if we keep this system, we're going to have intellects who are uh, weak and, oh, no, what was it? Uh, now I forgot. Mm. But I, I, yeah, and then we'll have warriors who are um, dumb, basically. It is. It's like we need both. We can't have a warrior who doesn't have any connection to self, sure. and we can't have an intellect who's not connected to the physical body. So absolutely, it's like, they're both. We're, we're different sides of the same coin. Yes. So we're I, moving to this whole person who is not active or passive. It's like we need spirituality for our own self awareness so that we can meet experiences in a higher vibration. Okay. It's not so we can do nothing and just accept it. It's like, no, we meet it and relate to it in a way that allows it to transmute the density that it exists in. Okay. To deconstruct what you're saying, in my mind, because uh, I sometimes (laughs) get lost with the the spiritual uh, uh, (laughs) uh, creative poetry there. Uh, But I think there are different ways of um, addressing a problem. And where is some people... I, I would fall back to a, approaching this from a, the warrior mentality of like, let's say, combating and trying to uh, c- combat something objectively. Your approach is through addressing this thing by beating it perhaps with love or through uh, uh, just dealing with the moment it's just with, the energy. with with, with it's a different like, energy. Yeah, I could you still can still. Someone yeah. With loving energy. It's like I could shout at someone with loving energy. Okay. It's I, like it's not, it's not about the doing. This is what I'm saying. When you give the importance on the doing, there's so many confusions that happen Mm. but it's actually just the way in which we meet things it's like if there's a fight going and i am tense and i enter that fight in tension and fear then i can only meet that experience with the same energy so i will perpetuate that energy more or forward however if i meet it in a different place even if i end up fighting or whatever if i meet it with a state of calm and a state of centeredness then that experience is met differently so then it can meet itself in a different way. I respect that. I, I And this is why I feel like it's important because we don't need to worry about children. We do need to worry about children that are starving or children getting away. Mm-hmm. However, I truly feel the way that we're going to change this or the way that it's going to move in a more uplifting way is mm-hmm. if people meet it in a more uplifting way. 100%. We're so dominant in trying to control everything that we keep creating these things through our control mechanisms. So I'm going to control myself. Now the world's controlling itself and all of the icky bits are just oozing through and manifesting in all these ways. And we're like, oh, this is that person's fault or that government's fault or that. It's like, no. It's like every time that you choose fear and control, you perpetuate that energy more. Every time. We're all society. I understand. I completely agree with that. It's a collective that. movement. It's not an individual movement. Sure. I think one of the most powerful ways to bring about change is to be the change you want to see in the world, to quote Mahatma Gandhi, right? <laughs> like you have a look. Look, cause let's talk about a serious issue at the moment because one of the things that I have to do in the Crystal Journey podcast is talk about world events, like on the <laughs> objective shit that is actually going on right now. And look, okay. we've obviously gone... Really yeah, involved, yeah, yeah, I know. That's that's fair <laughs> enough. That's, that's kind of like <laughs> diplomacy reigning in right now. But look, perhaps one thing we can, we can perhaps just... Um, talk about a little is just the different ways of addressing some of the problems that are going on in the world because okay for someone like me over the last few years I saw I saw the government do things which I personally and I think a lot of people would agree with were things that would infringe upon what we call our human rights okay like essentially for uh, force us to do things that we wouldn't um, do out of choice through coercion and so forth right and I would say that the best way to address that, now some people would take the political route and, and try to put people, certain politicians into power and so forth, but my approach from what I would say, a more spiritual route or perhaps a route kind of in line with what we were saying here is to, to, to be the change you want to see. Like if I didn't believe something was right, I wouldn't do it. If, um, if I was told, for instance, that I couldn't go out into a certain area because you know the government said so, I wouldn't do it. If someone told me that I had to, let's say, forcibly do anything to someone, I wouldn't do it. As simple as that. Rather than trying to uh, to, for- to force people to do anything, I would simply just go about my way and not acquiesce okay, to any of these things, right? Don't need to finish the point. And what I would actually see from that, and like, well, this is what one of the things I know, because I started doing this um, initially because this is just who I am, but 
a lot of people would start doing this because they would see more people doing it. It becomes easier to to do or not do something when enough people are doing it. We're, we're all very communal in the sense. Like you're familiar with the whole concept of uh, what's that experiment that they did, the Milgram experiment, where uh, when people are put in a situation where they have to make a decision and do something that they wouldn't do, it becomes easy for them to do that thing when they're listening to a higher authority figure or enough people are doing it. Yeah. Like there's another experiment called Ash Conformity that shows... When enough people are doing something, even though you think it is the wrong thing to do, typically speaking, psychologically, people tend to do that. So I think one of the powerful ways to bring about change is to actually do things that you believe are right and you do them with a, with a strong frame and people eventually uh, yeah. acquiesce to that. It is that. But what However, it, I feel you're going too much out to... The symptom. Because, mm -hmm. because the doing what you're told is like, all of these things are a little bit too far away from the individual. Because so every time the individual doesn't express their truth to their partner because they don't want to hurt their feelings, or every time they please someone else against their own knowing, or every time they don't express their emotions because sure. they're afraid of rejection, or it's like these, it, and this is the thing, the world is the, the symptoms. The world is a representation of the symptoms of the the inner world. So it's like, the reason that people won't follow their truth if they're told to stay inside or whatever is because they're already not following their truth. It's just the symptom. It's not. It's not like oh, the 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 government the government might represent so the father energy or it's like I always listen to dad or dad won't love me if I don't do what I'm told or um, what if I get rejected by society or what if if I'm not doing what everyone else is doing I won't be loved or I won't belong. It's like mm. it's like. Then there are inherent woundings that we carry, and if they are not addressed, it doesn't matter if every single so if every single person agreed with my frame of the of of how reality should exist, and okay. everybody existed that way, it would still collapse because of all of the things that I haven't yet owned. Because so if everyone was me or everyone listened to me, I was the supreme ruler of the world. Somebody would still upset and disappoint me, because. I have things in me that are still upset and disappointed. Sure. So it's it's not... We, we keep trying to fix the world. It's like it cannot be fixed. Well, I think it there are... Fixed well, the fixed in one sense... At the end of the day, there's always going to be elements of, of pain and suffering. That's that's the product of life, you know? But in terms of uh, of changing certain things for the better, they're always like... Uh, like just in terms of lore, like there are, there are things that we can always have in place that are are more in line with, let's say, nature or uh, or I would call, like, justice, human rights than others, you know? Like, if there have been certain unjust laws historically. Like, it's all right to, let's say, enslave men and women and so forth, right? That's something that we've abolished. We can, I think, most of us can acknowledge that that was a bad thing. Yeah, and, so even, yeah. even the nature argument, right? It's yeah. like, we're, we're not in the same time anymore. So technology yeah. is creating convenience of living, right? Mm -hmm. And we've used it to kind of, reinforce our comfort our so, so i call it the fishbowl we've used it to reinforce our fishbowl so mm -hmm. it's like i have a really comfortable strong secure fishbowl right now right mm -hmm. so that's the way we've used technology but it's only because it's, it's still early we're so young in this new way of existing but really technology is going to create from a conscious perspective technology creates the unnecessary um fear of survival it's like so i don't need to contemplate my survival anymore sure. because it's very easy to survive it gives me more time and more space to explore what you said i think you mentioned it to teal art or creativity or sure. so it's like like so nature moves in a rhythm that is more resonant with the way that we Oh sure, I would say technology is a part of nature. In this, I, when I use the word nature, now granted there are different ways of, determine, of defining that. Some people think it's things that have come from the earth, you know. But I, but I think maybe you made the point because I was talking about you know laws that are more in line with nature. I, I was actually making reference to uh, uh, I, one sustainability in terms of environmental things, which is very subjective. But just in terms of human rights, more in line, line with what I'd call natural law, like people's basic rights but in terms of nature like the delineation between technology and things that you know us human beings do and then things of the earth i i don't think either one is good or bad yeah. now granted i have my preferences i'm not opposed to using technology what i'm opposed to is people that try to force uh 
their will in others um, against their, yeah, trying to force their will in others when they're not doing any harm whatsoever. And I think we've seen so many laws enacted historically that have been enacted in order to achieve ends, right, certain ends, right. Um, and we've noticed that have been wrong later on, right, regardless of the technological advancements. And I just think that we need to establish that there are certain things that are obviously better than others if we believe in the the value of human life and things like that. That's why I, one of my podcasts I always talk, I always make reference to like things like uh, you know people's rights and, and the you know the concept of freedom and things like that because I think it's a very dangerous road you can go down on when you don't believe that anything should be objective in terms of people's rights, people's uh, ability to do things and so forth, which I see us going into. And granted, I'd say technology is making it easier for uh, for governments to do that. Like, I wanted to get your thoughts on, I mean, we both come from, you know, the financial world. We're obviously seeing uh, CBDCs now enacted, um, you know, central uh, bank digital currencies and so forth. And where is, as a technologist, I like the idea of technology. I can see how that's making, it's going to make it a lot easier to control people. Mm -hmm. And I do have a problem with that, particularly when, um, now they're going to be able to tell you what you can purchase and what you Well, I find can. it interesting, right? Because mm. So when, when, I, when I envision or when I see things, I see things very much in the collective energy and how collective consciousness is moving. Okay. So from what I can tell or can see... Do you want to just move in a bit closer? Like I feel like we're losing you. I just want to make sure you can hear yourself. Yeah. And um, yeah. So what I what I've perceived is that we have fortified the mental construct more than ever before. So, and the mental construct we have is for the purpose of feeling in control. It's like, that's why, that's why we even for, so I, I was speaking to um, someone the other day and they're, they're like, oh, I'm really just, I asked her what she wanted and she said, I want, I want to do more work so I can see more and know more and have more insights. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what I heard was, I want to have more control because I want to be able to know more than I know right now because what I know now makes me still uncomfortable with the not knowing. Sure. And it's like, everything that we do is almost like in reaction to the unknown because we're so afraid of the unknown. We're so afraid of this infinite space that we can't conceptualize what's wrong with that though? that's competency the more you yeah. learn yeah okay it, yeah it's competency sure but it also allows me to fortify and and um fortify the mind and also reinforce my identity constructs of this is me i have full control over me i know exactly what's going on with me and i'm going to be here and then i'm going to be here and then i'm gonna be here and then i'm gonna be back here and I have full control, and nothing's going to happen to break that. And if it does, it's probably going to cause a lot of discomfort. I don't think it's a bullion, though. I don't think people adopt wanting to know more about the world or immediately think yeah, nothing bad is going to happen, but they're trying so to minimize the harm that comes to them, Minimize the harm, yeah. right? But minimizing the harm perpetuates the harm because we, we keep trying to control the unfolding of the universe what the through our okay. perspective. Okay, Hold think, on, think, all right, I'll let you finish. One all second, right. one second, right? All right. Because we, it's like... It's like if I walk through an alleyway yeah, and I keep thinking, danger, I'm in trouble, danger, I'm in trouble, sure. danger, I'm in trouble, right? I see the point you're making. There's going to be danger and I'm going to be in trouble. But wouldn't you want to know also, about your environment? Yes, there's so a that natural can, intuition yeah. that recognizes, but That's then there's, there's a mental construct that perpetuates fear constantly. Mm. It's like my mind is Touché. always afraid. It's never not afraid. Sure. But here's the thing. If you can develop your mind to the kind of mind that doesn't become afraid of what might happen, however, still wants to learn more in order to bring, in order to achieve uh, a more harmonious existence, for instance, uh, knowing more about a country before you visit it, knowing more about whether it's the laws, um, diseases. I started gardening recently. I've been having all of these diseases in my plants, right? Therefore, I've been researching to try to figure out how to combat that. I made some special concoction just today, right? So I could do that. I wanted to know more so I could address certain issues. Now, granted, you're saying that it can be paralyzing when you get caught up wanting to know things. But the thing is, by developing a stronger mind, you don't get paralyzed by the things that you don't know. However, you become more competent and you learn more things so that you can bring about a better situation. No? 
see for me it's been the opposite it's like i've been the more you know the more paralyzed you become yes because you have more justifications you have more ways to reinforce the identity you got got to strengthen a lot i deal with this as well but that's why you got to strengthen the mind no this is no this is no so in my experience anyway so I've, I strengthened the mind and it was so fucking good. I was mm. so smart and I knew so many things. And then the last two years have been literally letting go of mind and letting the heart lead. I, and I am more aware, more in tune and more living. My quality of life is so much greater because sure. I'm less self-involved. Like I, know, I agree with you 100% on that. Because... The mind just wants to keep reinforcing the identities. That's the way it's designed. Here's where I agree with you on. I think you're going to be more content um, detaching from all this knowledge and all this kind of stuff, right? Like knowing one but of the problems. Detaching from knowledge. No, because but, all my but, knowledge now comes from wisdom of self. Who, who, the heart has more wisdom than the mind can even conceptualize. In certain aspects, absolutely. In all aspects. Well, there is an, look. <laughs> there is the intuitive mind, but there's all, like there there are different approaches to the truth. I mean, Manly P. P. Hall would speak about this all the time. One is through the uh, through obviously science, um, through logic, reason, philosophy, that kind of stuff. The other, the, the other, mind, yeah, the the intuitive mind, the yeah, through the latent consciousness <laughs> inherent within man, like through uh, intuitive faculties and so forth. Your 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 muscle. We're all endowed with these incredible abilities, no yeah. doubt. But there are different paths to this, right? But then there are certain, like for instance, you can just intuitively know that there are there are ways to uh, to make your plants grow better. But um, chances are, you're not going to have um, that kind of conscious access to it unless you do research so within because we are human beings that live in the actual world there are certain things that we need to consciously learn in order to cheat, to cheat things the idea of saying that because you're you're on in the heart level and you, you can just know everything therefore you don't have to learn things i just don't think is is the reality it's not that you don't have to learn things it's that your learning is in a different way it's like the mind feels like say when i do things to the mind it feels like i'm crawling I'm crawling through the universe, trying to slowly and in a really controlled way, Mm -hmm. just pick little bits of the universe and be like, okay, not too much, hold on, not too much. A little bit overwhelming. The mind only knows how to get overwhelmed if it's not crawling, Mm -hmm. right? It's like it can't keep up. The mind cannot keep up with Mm -hmm. existence, which is why we have such a strong wave of anxiety and depression because we've just... We'd, we're so trapped in our own minds. Yeah. Look, there's definitely truth with what you're saying. Like, I like this because we're both offering, um, at least in this moment, diametrically opposed perspective to pers- perspectives on addressing this issue of, like, trying to um, I- improve your situation and so forth. And I think they're both necessary. I mean, they're speaking about... Have you heard of the concept of the suppression of the feminine? Right. No. It's this. I. It's essentially we we refer to the the feminine as the intuitive mind, like the right brain, holistic thinking, that kind of stuff. And this is this is spoken about in one of my favorite documentaries, um, Esoteric, uh, by Ben. Uh, I think Ben Stewart is his name. Check it out. Uh, but there's also something called the suppression of the masculine, which is the logic, the reason, reasoning, the analytical mind, understanding certain principles of nature, like their actual lo- actual laws within nature. Now, granted, you can understand this intuitively, but it, I think it's important to understand this logically as well. This is why within, like, I, I come from a worldview where, like, my dad was, was deeply into the hermetical sciences, and that deals with, that's a lot of the, where the West gets a lot of its esoteric knowledge is from ancient Egypt, Kemet, right? Now, there's this figure known as Hermes Trismegistus, who was the master of the, what we call the sciences, so the technology, the, 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 the philosophy, all of that kind of stuff that is essentially dealing with the left brain knowledge. And the the works of the hermetical knowledge allow you to understand all these different areas of how the world works. Mm-hmm. Now, granted, it speaks about psychology, intuition, and so forth. Um, I think there's a lot of knowledge, a lot of um, worth value in actually learning things, not just um, not just being able to download all this information, having an intuitive awareness, but actually re- understanding like when you're going to let's say, uh, be a, a doctor or something like that, to learn about the different herbs, to learn about how they affect different species and of so course, forth. I'm not against learning. But the thing is, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, like the, the way in which you do that, like there has to be some kind of conscious component to it. And that's what I'm referring to when I talk about 
learning the logical aspect of trying to understand so things, how things work. Yes, so there are things that play in the constructive mind of how things work mm -hmm. in a in a in a in a construct. So in the in the medicine field, right? Sure. In that construct, I have to learn the things for that construct, right? Mm -hmm. You, you moved away from the mic now. Just uh, yeah, just yeah. a little. Just a little. Try to keep it on. You, you, you can hear yourself, right? Just uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, I can see. Now okay, I can, I yeah, can yeah. hear myself. All right. Um, now this is good stuff, bro. Like it's very, it's very analytical, which I know well, you try to move away I, from, but it's good. I have a very natural analytical mind. Yeah, even the way that I see con um, consciousness, it's very much I see it through the analytical mind. So okay. it's, it's it's not that I'm against mind, however. What I'm experiencing now is that mind is almost like it's like it comes through heart first, and then mind kind of makes the finer details happen, right? Sure. So it's like it's not because a lot of us are leading with mind, like we're leading with mind, which is a fear. It's a fear-based way to live because mind actually is. It's like I call it the protector identity because mm -hmm. the mind is the protector, the perceived threats. That's what the mind does. But however, the mind perceives everything as a threat. It tries to. The, the reticular well, because, activating system, well, there's it's, this, it's, there's this it's thing how, in us that doesn't what it's really called. feel safe. Yeah, it's always looking for ways in order to achieve certain goals. Like there's this part of your brain, if you want to do something or if you, let's say, so you, you want to survive, like it's instinctively looking at how to achieve uh, whether it's a goal, like let's say you want to, uh, let's say get lots of bitches or something like that, you're trying to figure out what you can do, what you can say to them. And in terms of survival, there is a part of the brain that is looking for threats because it wants to survive. Yeah, sure. Like, and I, I'm not. Is is that a negative thing in your mind? In your world, it's, it's not about it being a negative thing. It's just that when when I let the mind lead, I can only I can only move in a certain way. It's like. It's like if the whole if I'm in infinite potentiality, sure. if I lead with the mind, I half that. Maybe not even half. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. A, and it's like, well, it's like it, because, and this is the thing when we give so much importance on the doing, then the mind takes over on how things should be done. And it's like, if I'm in infinite potentiality, I don't know how things are going to happen. Not really. Mm -hmm. So if I let go of that and then meet them as they happen, and then I can use minds to maybe. Um, filter through how the, some finer details need to get done, like some physical things that you're talking sure. about, right? That is the only purpose that I see for the mind, to be able to deconstruct and reconstruct things, but then let go of them. It's like not give them any importance because it's like <laughs> I watched The Prince of Egypt mm -hmm. a few months ago. It's such a okay. good cartoon. Yeah. It's so, it's, yeah, it's a classic, yeah. right? And the big guy is singing to the prince about the carpet. He's like, you're so funny. You are one thread on this huge carpet. And mm -hmm. from that thread, you're trying to perceive the unfolding of what it means and what's happening. And it's like, we keep trying to do that because the mind keeps trying to understand things. Ooh. When you understand things, you're constantly standing under. It's like, there's a reason that it's said that way because you can't see all. You can't see all through mind. Mm -hmm. But you can feel all through heart. Yeah. I think there's a dis distinction between understanding something and understanding something or, yes. or yeah, out, so, like, like outer, like to see Buddha a broader perspective, perspective on the world. Yeah. Like he talks about the three types of wisdom. Mm -hmm. So um, the first type of wisdom is you go into a restaurant and you um, are looking at people eating and you're like, oh, what they're eating looks nice. And that's the first level where you kind of like, you just see it, right? Mm -hmm. And then the second level is seeing it for yourself. So you start looking at the menu and you're like, oh, this looks good. This looks good. This looks good. And you're like, what am I going to order? And then you're like, you order something. And that's the second level, which is like reading something for yourself and digesting it for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. And then the third level is you eat the food and then you experience the food and then you truly know what the food tastes like. Through. And it's like... It's experiential wisdom. Absolutely. So Buddha's, Absolutely. Buddha's, greatest, yeah. Buddha's greatest contribution to humanity was the recognition of experiential wisdom. 100%. Can I just comment and say that I completely agree with 
everything you've said, at least in the last 10 minutes, right? It's just, <laughs> in, in, the, in the only caveat is that because we can't gain access to the ideal, which is the holistic intelligence or the experiential knowledge, right? Um, there are other steps that you can you can take because you can't directly get access to that, or sometimes that will facilitate you getting to the end result. This is why Dao Zhu always say, said, know the masculine, but go with the feminine. This is why B Bruce Lee would say to become unnaturally natural, right? Because initially, the the process is to in initially like learn the logic, the reason, the theory, right? So that you don't have to rely on it to get to this holistic intelligence where you just intuitively know things. Yeah, that's the mastery. It's like a true master mm. has learned everything and then let go of it. And that is why they are now the master. Absolutely. Bro, bro. One thing I, I got to bring up, man, because I, I, you know, where is I, I get the impression like you don't like to get into the world events in terms of, you know, like a lot of that kind of jazz the lockdowns and shit like that yeah. politics. But one of the things that my podcast is very, very focused on is just, <laughs> bro, the UFO disclosure movement that is going on at the moment. Because, oh, uh, like, yeah, no absolutely. Because <laughs> uh, one of the things, look, we speak about a lot of things, but I, I remember uh, one of the things we'd speak about, you know, back in the day, I, I'd, I'd speak, I, I've always spoken about ufology, all that kind of stuff. And if I remember back then, you were still pretty kind of like, you know, UFOs don't exist. That's that stuff is nonsense. What do you What are your thoughts on on that kind of stuff? Um, I can, have you been yep. taking notice yep. of the the reports? Like, I've, have what's your assessment of all the stuff that's going on at the moment? I feel like it's it's kind of hard to say, but I perceive. So what I perceive is that mm -hmm. um, everything exists simultaneously in the same sphere in different ways. So it's like alien beings are just beings that exist here in a different frequency. So as we recognize different frequencies of being, we, and that's why people talk about like uh, being able to channel their guides or, sure. or like all of these, or demons or like all of these things are just sure. like different frequencies of recognizing something, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the same with the UFO things. It's like, I don't know, is it local? Is it, is it like, well, like, is they, it really that from, far from, away, from the perspective like of like the UFO disclosure, they're actually talking about like the people that have been coming out to talk about this thing. They're talking about these beings actually being like when we talk about UAPs, that's what they're called now. We're talking about a physical, uh, yeah, lo physical beings. local being here. So not something that's built of air and imagination, like, like a vision where when people are referring to, let's just say UFOs or aliens, we're talking about beings in the flesh that may be terrestrial. So may have origins on this planet or may have extraterrestrial or origins but um just whether you want to focus on the lore just focus on the reports we're talking about beings that have been interacting like i would interact with you like in the objective world of yeah. uh, subjective objectivity they like, like yeah where are they are they, they are like over the antarctic wall yeah are they in the earth's core or Abs are they in the ocean it's like sure you know they, they could be anywhere really like sure this, there's so much information that we're not privy to. Well, people say that because, look, here, my, my perspective on this is, look, granted, lately, people have been coming out speaking about how this stuff is an actual phenomenon. The government has been hiding you know, information about it. This is stuff that's within the exoteric now. So yeah. there's, a, there's a guy, I forget his name, something Greer, um, that has been speaking about. He was like, um, I can't remember, but he's, he's a figure in government, right, um, that was, was tasked with the effort of trying to uncover the, the government having uh, ascertained extraterrestrial beings, craft, and so forth. And granted, he has, he's, as much as what he, he's openly said that he 100%, based on the evidence that he's seen, believes that the government is, is hiding extraterrestrial craft, so essentially UFOs, and they have extraterrestrial beings. That's what's been said by him and many other officials. And let me just add this. This kind of information, you see, I find this interesting because whereas this stuff is being spoken about more within the like mainstream media, this kind of lore has been has been spoken about for as as old as time, not just within the ancient accounts, but in terms of uh, recent events like recent history. There's, I've read so many reports in regards to uh, um, the government having encounters with these extraterrestrials. Uh, reports from uh, from. Like people that had so much to lose in regards to this, like there is so much documentation on this topic that the idea of it being something that is 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 delegated to the realm of like just hocus pocus is just seems intangible for me. Like as a kid, I went through thousands of documents. What a friend of the family was able to get a hold of uh, of actual confidential. It sounds far fetched, but it's, yeah. it had confidential written over all of the documents, and I didn't realize 
the significance of it until much later on. But basically, my dad and I, we spent years going through all of these reports, right? Now, some of them seem very fanciful, but some of them are very much in line with the kind of stuff you've been hearing now. People have ha having close encounters with these beings. Yeah. And it's such a, it's such a, a widespread event. I mean, I've seen um, what we call UFOs. Like, we're talking about unidentified craft that fly at speeds that there's, I mean, to my recollection, there's nothing that we have that could have, could have, been able to do any of this kind of stuff in there. There's a well-known report. I lived in a place called Westall, right? Yeah. Just a few years ago. And there's an incident that took place. It's called the, I think it's the 1966 Westall incident. And it's one of the biggest UFO sightings um, in history where a whole school schoolyard, right, saw this UFO. And it's incredible because as you'd expect, these men in black suits appeared to try to cover up the information. There were teachers that actually took photographs of this thing. There's a kid that actually approached this uh, this vehicle, and there are, and the the people that actually witnessed this thing 50, 55 years later are still talking about this. Like mm -hmm. when I was living in West Dell, there was an anniversary uh, that took place, and um, some guy was trying to find out anyone that lived in the area if they still had recollection of this thing, but. The point is that this is a massive event that took place where people, many, many people witnessed this. And this is a, this kind of phenomenon is something that takes place all around the world. And to, for someone like me that finds this stuff very fascinating, it's so refreshing to see that it's been spoken about now in a more tangible sense. Like the yeah. media is actually looking at this stuff without laughing at it and realizing that, yes, the government's definitely covering this kind of stuff up. Well, I would also, mm, I don't know. You, because I feel yeah. like the world, like mm -hmm. like the world and the news, and it's 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 such a theater, it's such a performance. Oh, a hundred percent. So I was there like, is... okay, well, why is it coming out now? What is it trying to distract from, or what? Why it's like they're they're all like magicians. It's like, well, why are you trying to get me to look over there? What are you doing with the other hand? So one hundred percent. I kind of just that definitely goes like, on. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't really pay attention to. True. What, what someone wants me to see. Well, that's the thing. When you say when someone wants you to see, it's good. To, it's one. One you have to consider that there are many different parties um, involved in this thing. There are. There's one aspect of the government, right? Like the there's the the guy that is uh, is leading this uh, this movement. Well, at least one of the in inquiries here, where he's trying to un disclose all of this information, right? The Greer figure. But then there are other areas of government that are actually fighting against this kind of stuff. Like it's yeah. not all black and white. And we, we tend to look, when anytime we talk about the media, we seem to speak about it as if it's one entity, but there are, there is, there are many aspects of media, many individuals that are all trying to do certain things. Like there are, there are actively people that are trying to prevent this information from coming on. There are figures like uh, uh, Bob Lazar that has spoken about how these figures essentially try to discredit him, try to destroy all the information that he'd gone to certain established universities and so forth. Bob Lazar, by the way, is a figure that, um, speaking about the years about how he basically worked in um, S4 or th this is like this base not far from the Area 51 site, right? And was re-engineering um, extraterrestrial craft. I mean, the kind of craft that there's no way could have been made by human beings. And he has detailed information on this kind of stuff. But the interesting thing is because they wanted to discredit him because he had so much information on it, they literally like destroyed records of him going to universities. They created like all this bullshit information, right? And it's so clear, like he has all his schoolmates that went to university with him but there are forces that will try to discredit you so it isn't black and white like what we see in the media isn't a case of it like people seem to think in from my perspective that the media is doing one thing there are aspects of the media that are trying to do one thing but then there are aspects of the of the government the media that are trying to do something else so it's not as if there's just one hand that is controlling everything and even though there is there are aspects within the world that are fighting against that so it's very, I just think it's very black and white when people say that, well, it's the media that's presenting this, therefore it must, it must be fake when there are many parties involved. Well, I wouldn't say it's fake. However, mm. it's, it's kind of like, um, I perceive it. Yeah, so whenever I see collective things, I always perceive it as an, an, on an individual level mm -hmm. because it's, a, it's what, is this, what is this movement for? What is this movement in the individual sense? Because people have also interpretation of how things should be or what is true. or So there's no way to really know the truth outside of myself from someone else. 
outside of your own experience, outside would you wear that? Experience. Yeah, unless you'd actually directly experience something. Exactly right. I can respect that. So, but for me, I don't put energy into those things because they're, they're more just like uh, like um, mental masturbation. All right. And, and it's like, I get it, mm. but I don't see its relevance for my own knowledge. Develop, development. If anything, it just creates more information that I can't verify or don't know that's true. And then I've, I've got almost... I've put energy into something that is, may or is, may not be true. Yeah, it but, takes energy from okay. me. In terms of you trying to understand what goes on in the world, is there anything that you don't um, just delegate to your own first-hand experiential knowledge? Like, obviously, there are certain countries you haven't been to in the world, yes, right? There's well. You haven't had direct experience with these mm -hmm. countries, but there are obviously uh, people, authorities that you rely on to gain an, some sense of what is truth in regards to these countries. No. No? No. So you don't, you don't, do you, do you believe that France is a real country? I'm yes. sorry, have you been, have you been to France? I haven't been to France. Yeah, then why is it that you believe that France is real, but you don't believe, because even though many people have reported other things, you know, for instance, like blind sources and all that kind of stuff, why is it that you believe one is real and the other is not? Well, even when you say it's real, it's like, it's like, I don't know that France is real in my own experience. Okay. No, but no, no, I'm not. I'm not saying okay like, in, yeah, in terms of. God, I'm, about I'm trying. France, yeah. Read about France and sure. Know people from France. I, then, I can respect that. So, but I I don't know France. I haven't been there. Sure, but you. So you won't unless you've had direct experience with something. You won't accept it into your understanding of reality. Because I'd say there are yeah. a lot. Of, yeah, there are a lot. That's a very. It can be a very. It's mine or firsthand, like people I've met who have yeah. expressed from that place. Sure, I, I, I agree. Like we're both in agreement on that. There's nothing better than firsthand experience. There's nothing better than holistic intelligence. We can both agree on that. Yeah, yeah. However, well, I would say it's the only say, truth, really. Well, no. I mean, there, something can still be true, um, but it in your mind Does you just haven't accepted. You haven't accepted it, it as true. You know, like for instance. So if I don't uh, see it as true like, or accept it as true, then it, it is completely irrelevant. But that's, that's to the me. thing. This conversation happened. Like, <laughs> Regardless of whether you guys watch this or not, it happened, right? Like, if you have the perspective that it hasn't happened because you haven't experienced it, watched In a way, it directly, hasn't. it has. It and hasn't that's, that's these are the kind of conversations we'd always have at work, and like, it always like. So the thing is, is like drive me crazy because it's kind of like yeah, trying to give relevance to but things it, that are not relevant for you. No, it's and not it's relevant. Like, that's 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 fair enough. It may not be relevant, but the idea as to whether or not it happened is a boolean. It either happened or it didn't. Yeah, true. It may be relevant to you. That's that's a subjective opinion. But in terms of whether something happened or ha did not happen, that is either it happened or it did not happen. Like this conversation has happened, regardless of whether or not someone has experienced this. It doesn't matter. So if they haven't experienced it, it, it hasn't happened. It has. But we'll, we'll have to agree to okay, disagree so on that one. Yeah. Also, because everything is true and not true simultaneously. It's like infinite Not everything. Not everything. You see, this is when we move into the world of like just <laughs> philosophical, like uh, poor play, mumbo jumbo. You know, it's like everything is everything. Well, not not entirely true. Like there, there's an element of truth to that. Or maybe I could be wrong. Maybe it is that in this Euclidean meets face reality, everything is everything, and there is no objective truth. But I'll tell you what, there is no reason to um try to understand anything if that's the case because there's no i mean the yes, whole there isn't yeah well that's <laughs> that's actually yeah well that if you stop trying it just comes to you anyway it's well like, that is still that it, i would still whether you're trying or not trying i think you're still you can still learn and i'd say there's an importance in learning the truth but if you're saying that the truth is yeah, not does not it's exist not, it's not learning the truth it's all experience yeah it doesn't i use we the word learning really yeah because learning is something that pro is projected as i'm moving forward but it's not it's a realization yeah that's learning is any realization anything that brings you closer to the actuality of truth love is learning is growth is an efflorescence of consciousness i think to deny that is to deny reality well you're already there at well, the same time. yes, but we've been disconnected from it within this conscious see, body that I'm in, in, in. Well, in the sense that consciously, right, I am not consciously aware of everything at this point in time. Granted, my higher self may be, I am not. Therefore, by matriculating my conscious mind into higher levels of awareness, I can gain a greater understanding of the world. But it's the same thing that you were just saying. It's already happened. Yeah, but I... Yeah. <laughs> Even if you haven't experienced it, it's already happened. Yeah, that's non sequitur. My, my point is that it's important for me to understand things, to go about learning things so that I, with, at least within this physical body, 
consciously can have a better understanding in order to bring me to a higher awareness in this reality. Sure. <laughs> okay. Sure. Bro, that was <laughs> that was deep, man. We've gone we've gone so deep into these uh, metaphysical uh, conversational <laughs> jujitsu sessions, and I expected nothing other. <laughs> Jamil, you were you were one hell of a guy, brother. I got to tell you that. Um, <laughs> ever since I've known you, man, you've always been um, a free thinker, and you've always been someone that has pursued spiritual enlightenment. We've take, we've definitely taken on different approaches towards it, but I, I've always admired your uh, your your steadfast nature in um, in believing what you believe, yeah. and. Uh, you know, walking the path. And it's been a pleasure to get you on this podcast, man. Um, I know you've been doing a lot of these public speaking podcasts, uh, uh, arrangements more, uh, regularly now. Like, do, do you, do you have, like, do you have a channel or something that you're, no, not yet. it's something that, um, oh yeah. Now I'm starting to work on having my own one. All right. Yeah. But you'll, I'll, you'll obviously plug that. I'll get your details. I'll plug it on this podcast. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to hear more of these spiritual musings from Jamil J the conscious soul brother uh be sure to tune into the crystal journey podcast be sure to tell your mom tell your friends about this and uh share all the the tiktok uh, uh clips that i'll be sharing your way but uh until next time as i like to say remember there are three things that cannot remain hidden for long the sun the moon can you guess what the last the one is truth. my man oh so there is a truth there is a truth the the truth the truth <laughs> <laughs> my man, Jamil, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on this podcast, man. Um, so, I'll be sure to put this out on all my social medias and, and plug you. And this will be fun. I think this will this is this has been fun for me. And yeah. I hope people enjoy this. Let me know with your likes, your shares, if you if you feel this kind of stuff. If you want to hear more of this content. And uh, until next time, kisses, hugs, belly rubs. Signing out, the chocolate Nubian soul brother. Ow! Oh man, what a roller coaster! Oh. That was uh...